गुड इवनिंग My great pleasure to welcome all of you for today's webinar, and it's uh, going to be very interesting. I am sure because of Dr. Jayadeep, and uh, I am very happy to welcome. I am sure Jay for the Jayadeep. This is not the first time he is visiting uh, Kerala. You can see the background of Dr. Hissi, and uh, you can see Kerala is like. And uh, a special welcome to Jayadeep. And in spite of all your busy schedule, you have found time to take part in the webinar. And thank you very much, um, Dr. Jayadeep, um, the former president of uh, Foxy. And I also welcome all others, all other participants. Um, they are all our own members, and I am very happy to see them, all of them, after a long, long time because of this uh, COVID problem. We are not meeting each other, and uh, we are really missing each other. And it is nice to see all of you once again. I welcome all of you. I hope you will have a nice day today. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, uh, we today's uh, this is uh, I think after our lockdown, this is our third uh, uh, coaching society meeting. Uh, one we had. Uh, uh, with the oncology topic, one we had with the uh, infertility and uh, uh, multiple pregnancy, with uh, combined with the uh, Ritchie Society, and this is the third one. We are happy to have an esteemed faculty like uh, Jaydeep Madam, Jaydeep Madhotra Madam, who has, uh, Grace Madam told, in spite of her busy schedules, has come to join he uh, here. Yesterday, we had, there had been heavy rains and uh, disruption of the internet in Agra, even then she to pain to join in time for this uh, uh, webinar and uh, uh, and also we have the three chairpersons uh, dr professor adamani madam uh, professor miriam and smithy sanal smithy will be joining in 10 minutes and uh, uh, i think uh, uh, i think uh, 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 i think we can give the introduction slide of jd madam madam i think doesn't need any introduction actually in our society because madam has Come number of times to Cochin, and uh, also as you all know, she was the uh, president of our uh, uh, FOXI, uh, and she is the managing director of the Rainbow Hospital, and uh, uh, she was the president and one and only president from India of Aspire Asia Pacific Initiative Reproductive uh, Reproduction in from 2014 to 16, and also Madam was the president of Indian Menopausal Society from 2016 to 17. And uh, as you all know, she was the president of Foxy also. And uh, uh, she was the president of Indian Society for Aster Reproduction uh, last year, and president of uh, SSAFOMS, and pre president of ISPATH also. And she was the editor in chief of the, uh, the Suffolkans uh, uh, SAFOMS journal. And she took the initiative of uh, making these journals very popular, and uh, it has been. Uh, uh, very much uh, uh, indexed also and she was also a member of the reproductive medicine uh, reproductive and technology committee of the figo and uh, as, you, as you know she was the editor of uh, and co-editor of many many books and she'll be today talking about and uh, enlightening uh, us about the rh negative pregnancies and we have got three wonderful chairpersons uh, like uh, uh, radhamani madam uh, she is a professor and an HOD of the uh, Department of Gynecology of the uh, Amrita Institute of Medical Science. She was the past president of our coaching society and the executive president and uh, scientific committee chairperson of our society and coordinator and examiner of National Board of Examinations and author of Handbook of Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, and Viva in 2018. Second, we have uh, Smithy Sanal. She will be joining in 10 minutes. She is a senior consultant and gynecologist and mm -hmm. surgeon of Cooperative Hospital Karkanad. She was the editor of Coaching Society, also the secretary previously. At present, she is the Adelson Committee Chairperson of the Kerala Federation of mm -hmm. And uh, we have the third chairperson, we have Dr. Mariam George Fenn. Uh, she is the professor of MRC Medical College, Colin Cherry. Uh, she did do a postgraduate from CMC Vellore. Uh, she had interest of high risk obstetrics and laparoscopy surgery, and she is a very good undergraduate and PG teacher. 
Uh, she is a consultant gynecologist. Uh, she was a senior consultant gynecologist at the Cooperative Hospital uh, Cochin and the Adolescent Committee Chair. Uh, and uh, press, and uh, her main interest is the Adolescent uh, Health. And over to you, uh, JD Madam, for the uh, for the talk. Madam, this is yes. Madam, is it? Uh, yeah, a very good evening to all of you. And it's such a pleasure to be with uh, all my dear, dear friends, Gracie, Mariam, Dr. Radhamani, Fessy, and Smithy. I uh, have had the unique privilege of you know meeting all of you on many occasions and working also together. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity that even sitting in my home, uh, I can be with you all in Cochin. Uh, thanks to Science Integra, you know, for this unique interaction. Uh, today, uh, we will discuss uh, RH negative pregnancies and the newer concepts in uh, managing them. Madam, the question, I, uh, can you tell the audience if you have any questions, they can put it, write it in the chat box so that the end uh, 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 we can answer that, madam. That uh, if, if yeah. you don't, then they won't be ready with that. Okay. So, uh, you can put your questions in the chat box and... Uh, I'll try my best to answer to all of them. Um, you know, when I was a postgraduate and even many years later also, any time when I would see an RH negative pregnancy, especially an ISO immunized one, uh, it used to be a real scare. With all those lilies, charts and, you know, the queen urns and all that, I mean, it. I absolutely used to go for a toss and uh, nothing was available much except for the profile axis and it used to be a real real challenge and when i now today you know understand uh, things have become so simplified and uh, also understanding has uh, you know improved such a lot but before i go even into uh, understanding an rh negative pregnancy i would really it helps to understand the blood grouping system and it's very, very important for us to understand this before we even understand anything else. Now, uh, all of us understand, you know, uh, the ABO and RH, uh, this thing. But RH itself, uh, basically, when we see here, this is the RBC. And on the RBC, we have these antigens. Now, we have various systems. We have ABO and we have, you know, the D system. Then we also have the C and the E, and then we have many other epitopes also, which determine, you know, what kind of a, a blood group we have. And also these antigens also designate us as a particular uh, person. Now, why it is important for us to understand this? Because if we have this D here, that means that we are RH positive, and this is an antigen which is there on the top of the uh, red blood cells. Now, uh, we understand that these red blood cells basically are formed in our uh, body. And once a baby is there, um, you know, pregnancy happens and uh, there are waves of erythropoiesis which happens. So the first wave starts in the yolk sac itself. Now, uh, if we've done ultrasound, like most of us understand that uh, yolk sac is the first thing which we see in a gestational sac and as early as a missed period or, you know, latest by uh, five weeks, an RBC production starts right there. Now, the genes which are there, each one of us has 23 pairs of chromosomes. Now, the genes which actually define us for, by our blood group are there on this chromosome one. If you see here this pair, now the genes defining RH uh, antigen are located in the short arm of chromosome one. Now, uh, as the yolk sac also advances, and we know that the antigen, this RH antigen is present on the RBC as early as 38 days of gestation, which is about six weeks plus. Now, why I am telling you this is also very important. Because so many times, you know, you have very early abortions or an ectopic pregnancy, and we don't even consider giving a, a, 
back up you know uh, antibodies when we are doing all those processes and uh, it just takes a very small amount of uh, fetal maternal bleed as little as less than 0.1 ml for the blood to sensitize the mother now this is very important for us to at i have written 0.1 but there are studies which actually tell us even 0.03 ml of blood uh, is enough to sensitize get a woman uh, sensitized now uh, the another aspect which i want uh, everyone to understand is now this is the rh you know uh, factor or rh genes which are there on the rbc now you have if there are adequate amount of these genes here these epitopes here then you understand that this is a normal amount of rh antigen present on the rbc in this again we have a concept of a weak d a weak d means that these epitopes are there but this amount of antigen is smaller so the antibodies reaction which is going to happen is not going to be as much as a normal but still there will be some amount of um, uh, reaction which is going to happen and that demands attention and that is what we need to understand another important aspect before we go further is to understand the zygosity of a particular individual now we know that the mother is rh negative and she does not have this d mother does not have and there's nothing called as small d which exists you only have the big d and if the father has big d on both these chromosomes if you can see here then the father is homozygous now it has an implication to know the zygosity the nature of zygosity for the father now if the father has the big d only on the one chromosome then the father is heterozygous now what does this mean that if the father is heterozygous then at least 50% of the children will be rh positive and the rest 50% will be rh negative now in this kind of a couple the 50% of the pregnancies there will be no sensitization that we need to understand but if the father is homozygous that means 100% of the children are going to be rh positive so the chances of sensitization are going to be much larger so once we have understood that now let us come to the incidence of rh negative blood group now we understand <coughs> that the incidence of rh negative uh, blood group is quite a lot in the belt which is near uh, gujarat or the sindhis or the kachis uh in the pakistan area of sindh and our area of sindh and gujarat and uh, the kutch area uh which is almost about 12 to 15% while in the japanese and chinese it is about 1% and in the north american indians it's about 2% and the african and americans uh, like they are about 4 to 8% and caucasians have 15 to 16% where does india stand india stands at about 5 to 7% uh, incidence of rh negative and it's a good number we should be really focusing on it but i want to tell you something i when i was researching i looked at kerala uh, can anybody tell me like how much kerala what percentage of rh negativity uh, kerala has it is probably the highest in the country and if you see here and this is a very latest uh, paper which has come up which says that kerala has almost about 10% of rh negative uh, population and uh, they are attributing it to the jewish and the persian migrations into kerala which came in you know some time ago and that's why there is a high frequency of uh, rh negative people in kerala and uh, i was just wondering you know why if, to me you know um, the science indigra is telling me to talk about rh negative to cochin people uh, i can understand right now now next thing which we need to understand is the fetal maternal hemorrhage now we understand that a um, small amount of blood as little as 0.1 ml is required to sensitize a woman Uh, who is uh, actually not carrying any anti d uh, antigen or antibodies now almost about 30% of the rh negative uh, 
people will never develop rh incompatibility now what is the reason behind it we don't know even sometimes you know when you challenge them with large volumes of uh, rh positive blood they will not have any kind of an incompatibility or any problem but the others might have with a very small amount also they get sensitized and uh, there are two mechanisms with which we can actually get uh, allo immunized one is where you have you know transfused and incompatible blood transfusion when rh negative you have given a rh positive uh, blood transfusion and the other is what we all know about is a fetal maternal hemorrhage between the mother and an incompatible uh, fetus now the fetal maternal hemorrhage uh, can occur in any pregnancy but during the pregnancy they are minimal it's a, just about 10% but majority of the fetal maternal exchange of blood actually happens during the delivery and that is where our major focus actually has to be and but there have been plenty of studies which have studied that fetal rbcs can actually be detected in the maternal blood in all the three trimesters to the tune of like in the first trimester lesser about 7% in the second trimester about 16 and in the third trimester as much as 29% and uh, so they they can be there um, and this exchange uh, does happen and the initial maternal response now if a mother is carrying an rh positive baby and this now blood has gone into the mother's body the initial response is going to be in the form of because this is an antigen the blood fetal blood cells have gone into the mother now the mother's response is going to be in the form of antibodies and these antibodies will be igm and that is the first initial response which will come into the uh, in the mother's body now uh, fortunately for us uh, these igm uh, antibodies are large so they do not travel back from the mother through the placenta to the baby and they will develop within a week's time so uh, that is where we understand the uh, that when we are giving prophylaxis we want to give it within the 72 hours because we don't know when you know this antibodies will be generated and uh, then the re reaction of uh, the igg will also come up now once igm antibodies are there after that within like let's say between 6 weeks to 6 months igg will be formed so igg antibodies are small and they can cross the placenta and then they can go back to the baby or the fetus now this fetus already has antigen and once these antibodies cross and they go and stick to the antigen uh, then the hemolysis of the rbcs of the baby actually start and then the cascade of the events uh, will start uh, happening and uh, this is something which we know will uh, happen and the sensitization of this uh, mother and the repercussions on the baby are going to happen but because majority of this interaction uh, happens <coughs> at the time of delivery so most of the times the first baby is spared and uh, is not affected and if we have not given the immuno profile axis at that point of time then the second baby is going to be the one if that one is positive is going to be affected more and that is what we need to uh, understand but the same process can happen if somebody has had an abortion before which has not been covered or has had, had an ectopic pregnancy which has not been covered or in the same pregnancy in a primary gravida if you have had a subchorionic bleed or an embryo reduction has happened and uh, you know the exchange the fetal maternal hemorrhage has happened at that point of time which was not covered that even in primary gravidas this can happen so let us now understand once the igg antibodies cross the maternal circulation over to the fetal uh, circulation so they will actually start destruction of the fetal cells and uh, there will be hemolysis which will happen and the fetal cells will start breaking down now once the fetal cells start breaking down and fetal anemia sets in because there's a fall in the hematocrit uh, 
there will be a breakdown into heme and this heme is actually converted into bilirubin that's why fetal hyperbilirubinemia happens and both these components are neurotoxic and though they are you know cleared by the placenta uh, but they have their effects now if this sensitization has happened and the breakdown of the fetal hemoglobin starts then we have to understand and this is very important for us to understand that the fetal hematocrit will fall by 1% per day now what does this mean that in a week's time the fetal hematocrit will fall by 7% that accounts to almost 3.3 grams of hemoglobin so a fetus which was which a normal hemoglobin is about 15 or 16 uh, grams <coughs> has now the fall starts on a weekly basis by almost 3 grams so meaning that this fetus in the next 4 to 5 weeks will come down to a level where it will fall so much that the other symptoms in the baby of uh, high drops or erythroblastosis fetalis will actually start occurring and this knowledge is very important for us to understand because we need to pick up the baby at the time when the baby is going to have anemia and that's important because we can save almost 85% of these pregnancies even when they are sensitized if we can pick up the fetal anemia now that is the most important thing so this is just a diagram which is actually showing you the pathophysiology of isoimmunization and if it you can see if it happens in utero there is anemia now uh, uh, the body responds to anemia the fetal body will respond because it, now in the second wave of erythropoiesis after the yolk sac is the fetal liver so now the fetal liver will start getting enlarged there will be splenomegaly because there's destruction happening so the liver will enlarge and the spleen also will enlarge and slowly and slowly when the anemia you know uh, because the destruction is happening bilirubin is rising there will be portal hypertension there will be a um, glycol hypertension and this baby will land up into heart failure and the all the cardiac symptoms there will be pleural effusion there will be pericardial effusion there will be ascites and ultimately iud so this is the sequence of events which will happen in this baby if this anemia is actually not corrected now <clears throat> first thing is that you need to suspect second thing is that you need to test and the test can be done very simply by an indirect coombs test and the third important thing is that when you are doing a normal ultrasound you must look at these signs because these signs also can you know generate some uh, suspicion if you are seeing here there is a hepatomegaly there is a splenomegaly which is there now if you see something like this sometimes you might see mild ascites and also you can see here pericardial effusion now so all these signs should not be ignored which is very very important for us to understand this uh, actually just explains what i have explained to you right now on how the destruction of the hemoglobin leads to various events in the baby <clears throat> now what is the sensitization risk not every mother uh, who is rh negative and is carrying an rh positive baby will actually get sensitized and will have isoimmunization that is what we need to understand now almost about um, a lot of uh, people like without profile access also about 16% of them uh, after two deliveries uh, will not actually that's the percentage which will get actually sensitized now imagine now out of these about 2% of them this, they will occur in the antepartum period about 7% within 6 months of delivery because we understand you know the antibodies take that much time and uh, about 7% will uh, have in the early second pregnancy and if we give profile access we can bring this percentage down to 0.1% and that's a very important uh, figure now <coughs> sorry the uh, the risk also depends on a lot of things because as i said it uh, it's not only 
on the fetal maternal bleed it actually depends upon the volume of the transplacental hemorrhage it also depends on the extent of the maternal immune response and it also depends on the concurrent you know abo incompatibility which uh, may be there again so uh, we need to consider all these that's why you know some uh, babies in spite of uh, having a isomenized mother will have a pregnancy where you know it will just go on and not have much effect only mild anemia will be there and you can actually pull through uh, and not much intervention is required but in others you might have to do a little uh, more uh, monitoring and also uh, intervention now let's come to the management and we understand that the uh, history is very very important because a lot of times in these rh negative mothers we forget most of the times we sometimes you know uh, i know that everyone does uh, blood grouping of both the uh, partners but there will be still a few where it can be missed or a history of the patient has not given you the history of a previous abortion um, she may not have so you need to ask them the you need to ask them about the invasive procedures if there is any which has been done any kind of uh, abdominal or pelvic trauma any kind of uh, antepartum hemorrhage then multiple uh, gestations these, these are the events where manual removal of the placenta has happened in the last uh, delivery or ectopic pregnancy whether it was immunoprophylaxis was given or no and so many times uh, we miss the history of embryo reduction because a lot of ivf pregnancies are happening so these all these triplets and all people are reducing and if you have not done a, a blood test at that time or if you have not paid attention and not covered this in an rh negative then those can also be even in primary gravidas those can have a sensitization happening and have an effect on the baby the other aspects of history which uh, need to be explored are if there was any prior blood transfusion and uh, when we find that out the first and the foremost thing which we need to do is find the blood group of the husband because that's very important because that if the husband is negative it has actually ruled out a lot of issues if the husband is positive then we need to find out whether the husband is homozygous or heterozygous because again if it is homozygous you know that 100% of the babies are going to be positive and the chances of uh, problem are going to be there now even in the previous uh, pregnancy if the patient has had high drops and has lost the previous pregnancy because of high drops then rest assured that almost 90% chances will be there for recurrence to happen in this uh, particular uh, pregnancy then let's also understand that whether immunoprophylaxis was given in the previous pregnancy what was the dose if you had any hemorrhage during pregnancy because so many times under cover is done that the patient needs a higher dose but because we normally give a blanket dose of 300 micrograms it may not be enough in some people and that's why sensitization has come up in this and even icd positive uh, test has come up in this particular pregnancy we need to understand all those things uh, which are important for us <coughs> so once we have a patient uh, who is rh positive in our uh, rh negative in our uh, clinic and uh, we need to now have the management in place now the objectives of this management are that this rh negative mother has a spouse who is rh positive and we need to understand that we have to prevent the allo immunization uh, if this mother is unsensitized and that's very important for us to understand if you have not been able to prevent or if she has been sensitized before in the previous pregnancy and she comes to you and you do an indirect combs test and find out that she uh, she is icd positive now our first and the foremost duty is that we need to do an early detection and the treatment of fetal anemia has to be in place now it's very it's not that difficult because if we have identified this uh, woman and we have identified that she is already you know sensitized with an indirect combs test positive we need to have a management protocol in place we need to tell her that this is what we are going to do 
and this is how your pregnancy is going to be managed <coughs> i'll come to that a little later now if it is a simple case of a primary gravida where you know um, there is no sensitization and you just need to have immuno profile access in place uh, then we need to just take a few uh, precautions during the delivery um a neonatologist is normally always present when you are delivering uh, we uh, recommend that don't give oxytocin at the delivery of the anterior shoulder early clamping of the umbilical cord is indicated and uh, we if there is some suspicion of sensitization maybe you can leave the cord a little longer for you know rest of the test to be done and take a cord blood to uh, do the blood group of the baby and you know the direct combs test if required now it is recommended that at normally also we recommend that don't do any manual removal of the placenta and in these cases more so because any kind of intervention which we will do will increase the fetal maternal hemorrhage and thus the chances of uh, having a requirement of a higher dose of uh, antd is going to be there so but if it is required then do as gently as possible and if this mother requires a uh, blood transfusion then obviously it has to be an rh negative uh, blood now in the postpartum management uh, the cord blood as i said Uh, is normally taken an abo and rh typing for the baby's blood group is done a direct combs test is done and if you have any suspicion then you can do a hemoglobin for the baby which normally we do and a bilirubin levels uh, are done uh, at that point of time only now we are very happy if the baby is rh negative so no further intervention is required but if the baby is rh positive now then our exercise starts now one exercise can end right here that you can just give 300 micrograms of rh antd and a uniform cover of um, almost about 99% uh, women will take place and we don't have to bother much about but supposing now this pregnancy was a twin pregnancy or you had some intervention or you had to remove the placenta or there was an accidental hemorrhage or there was more bleeding where you expect a larger fetal uh, fetal maternal bleed then definitely we must calculate the amount of bleed and that can be very easily done uh, it's not at all difficult uh, that these tests are available Uh, a simple test would be a rosit uh, fetal rbc test this is how it looks so you can see here the fetal uh, rbcs will form you know these small rosettes and you know that this is positive and fetal fetal maternal hemorrhage has taken place but the most simpler one is a kehor betke test which you can see here down <coughs> <coughs> and this is again a very simple test and can very easily be done the maternal blood is taken and i would suggest that whatever the procedure may be uh, whether it's a delivery or an abortion or uh, you know uh, any invasive test has been done the maternal blood should be drawn at least 45 minutes later not immediately because once the fetal maternal bleed happens not all the fetal blood uh, will come into circulation so you might have an estimation which is not very accurate so wait for about 45 minutes and then take the maternal blood and then do these estimations <clears throat> now these estimations are also important because once you estimate uh, especially where you are suspecting a larger fetal maternal bleed then the right dose of antd Uh, can be given and that is again very important because then there is a good cover it's not a half uh, done job and uh, with simple calculations this is how you know it's a simple test clehor bet case test uh, where a qh solution is actually used and that basically you know dissolves all the maternal adult rbcs and you can only see this beautiful pink rose pink colored uh, fetal rbcs and you can then calculate the number of uh, fetal rbcs per um, hyper field and uh, normally they expect uh, you uh, to count about 2000 cells and then calculate the percentage 
now <clears throat> why all these things are important understanding them is also very important that if we have given a universal cover of 300 micrograms which all of us do then it will cover about 99% of the women with an average fetal maternal bleed uh, which is close to about 4 or 5 uh, ml at the time of uh, delivery but larger fetal maternal bleeds like instrumental deliveries or an lscs where lscs rate is almost about more than 40 50% can have a larger amount mrps iuds or abdominal trauma accidental hemorrhage twin pregnancy all that those can have a larger bleed and that's why we must understand that you know uh, calculation of and that can be very easily ordered you don't have to do it just send the blood to the lab and they will do it for you and these are the ones where you will require uh, a larger dose now another very important area which we have not paid our attention to is the over the counter availability of oral abortifacients now most of the women will just procure them from the counter and we have already understood that uh, you know uh, the rbcs are there in us uh, in the circulation from 5 to 6 weeks onwards of gestation so uh, alloveinization can happen even after oral abortifacients and that's where uh, though we had controlled the rh isoimmunization but after these oral abortifacients have come up uh, this ha- there has been a little surge in these uh, in the rh isoimmunization cases again so based on the clear bed k test you can actually then calculate the amount of fetal maternal bleed or hemorrhage now uh, it's very simple so once you will get a volume of the fetal maternal bleed which is based on the percentage of the fetal rbcs along with mother's uh, blood volume upon 100 so you know that yes xyz ml of fetal maternal hemorrhage has happened now how do we really calculate the dose we calculate the dose we understand that 300 micrograms of antd actually will neutralize about 15 ml of the fetal rbcs or 30 ml of fetal maternal blood so we have to then calculate accordingly so if this volume is let's say 15 ml <coughs> of the fetal maternal bleed actually 150 microgram of dose is sufficient but we always give a little extra now in our country we uh, have availability of only two dosages 150 and 300 so we don't really have option of a lower dose which we normally you know if you read the books uh, the recommendation is that you can give 50 micrograms for a 2 ml bleed or uh, in an early first trimester abortion you can give a le- little lesser dose but we don't have the availability so that's why we have to think about 150 300 450 or 600 uh, like that depending upon the amount of hemorrhage which has happened so that's why where calculation is very very important sometimes you know you have some people have these software based calculations also where you can calculate the amount of rbcs which uh, uh, need to be uh, transfused once uh, we have uh, in, in uh, intrauterine transfusion uh, to be done so software is also available let's come to the anti uh, d immunoprophylaxis now <coughs> very important because so these are you know small small details sometimes we don't pay heed to uh, i don't remember instructing the nurse that please don't give an anti d injection in the gluteal region uh, now we have to understand that this injection has to be given in the deltoid muscle because the fat in the deltoid muscle uh, area is the minimum and the needle which we use Uh, will go into the muscle and the proper dosage will be definitely administered so these small especially in very obese patients uh, if you are giving in the gluteal region then maybe the absorption is not going to be as much and then the effect is also not going to be uh, according to what you have actually calculated 
Now, <coughs> sorry. So, uh, dose calculation I have already told you uh, that we need to do either by the Clayhor Betke test or sometimes, you know, in some good labs, flow cytometry is also available, which will calculate the dose for profile access. I have also told you that whenever we are collecting uh, blood, maternal blood, we must give at least 45 minutes to one hour after the insult has happened so that we get an accurate figure. Now, if no tests are available, as we have, this, uh, there are times where, you know, smaller areas where no tests are available, a standard dose of 300 microgram will cover up almost about 99% of the uh, patients. Now, about 0.3% of the women uh, will have a fetal maternal hemorrhage, which is larger than 15 ml. And those are the ones who will require a higher dose. So that's where your calculation will come up. Now, let's come to the timing of immunoprophylaxis. Now, for any immunoprophylaxis, uh, I'm sure I have tried to make you understand why this timing is important. Within the first 72 hours, if you have given the immunoprophylaxis, now this will cover up all the fetal cells which have traveled into the mother's uh, body and this antigen-antibody complex will form and block it there for any uh, antibody reaction to happen in the mother. Now, uh, as we have understood that the IgM will come up within a week's time, and the IgG will come up within six weeks to six months' time. So if you have, by chance, not covered her up in the first 72 hours, uh, there are suggestions where you can give the dose uh, till about nine to ten days. Though the cover is not going to be as great, but will might still give her some protection. And the women who are already sensitized, meaning like who are already ICT positive, they don't need any anti D injection. So that also has to be very, very clear uh, for all of us. Now let's come to the more difficult part, which is the antenatal management. Now, <clears throat> once an antenatal man patient comes to you, the first and the foremost thing which we have to understand is the immune status of that woman. So that immune status will be known by uh, performing an indirect uh, Coombs test and if the woman uh, or this patient is not immunized then we have to prevent the ISO immunization and if she is already immunized then our foremost aim is to detect the fetal anemia and prevent hemolysis as, as much as possible because that is the one which is going to cause all the uh, fetal complications and a lot of emotional and physical and financial trauma to the parents. So these RH negative mothers are really special in the sense that their antenatal management, their intrapartum management and their postpartum management is all a little different. Now once we know that she is RH negative, we need to uh, do the husband's blood group. And we also need to do the indirect Combs test in the first visit itself. Now, if the indirect scoops, I am going to come to that a little later, but if it is negative, then you can repeat it in uh, on twenty uh, in the 26th week or in the 32nd week. Even if it is positive, you need to repeat it and then you have to repeat and do the titers. Now, titers also, according to a lot of people, have actually no value because we say that the critical titer is 1 is to 32. But there will be uh, women who actually uh, will have problems even with 1 is to 16. And there will be also women where no problem will happen even in 1 in uh, 256 or maybe more. So we need to understand. But sometimes when you're covering up a pregnancy, then these titers are important because then your dosage needs to be uh, altered. Now, if ICT remains negative, nothing has to be done. Only antipartum prophylaxis has to be given. Now, there are two schools of thought here. Uh, one school of thought is that you only give 300 micrograms at 32 weeks. 
now we do understand that in the first second and the third trimester there is a small amount of eto maternal exchange which is happening so the other school of thought is that you give 150 micrograms at 26 weeks and another 150 micrograms at 32 weeks so this is something which uh, is very individual depending upon what school of thought you are following now there is a scientific basis to this also because as i told you that igg antibodies take about 6 weeks to 6 months to develop also the antibodies that you give an icd cover it stays for good for 6 weeks so that's why if there has been a fetal maternal bleed uh, and if you are covering it up then you need to also understand that once you have given an immunoprophylaxis uh, for a week the icd will become positive but not more than that and then the icd will become negative after a week and if you do the dilutions then at that point of time this dilution will never go beyond 1 is to 2 so that this is because of your immunoprophylaxis and not because of the others the other dilutions can uh, go on depending upon the sensitization or the antibody response which has happened now if icd is negative as i said nothing has to be done if icd is positive we don't have to worry we have to just learn to manage this problem and we have to identify and manage this problem and how do we do that which is very important for us to now understand <coughs> that this is a sensitized pregnant woman and we have taken the history we have taken whether the previous baby was affected or no and whether prophylaxis was given uh, in the previous pregnancy or no and what are the antibody titers in this pregnancy and what would really help you also is to find out whether the uh, the genotype of the father now that genotype i have explained earlier also now if the father is heterozygous that means only 50% of the children will have rh positive now if this pregnancy has an rh negative baby then you need not worry about it and everything will be fine but if the father is homozygous that means 100% of the babies are going to be rh positive that means this pregnancy also will have a problem as the previous one you need to monitor it well so that is where uh, our understanding of all these things is very very important so if the previous pregnancy was affected and the father's genotype is what we have now understood the past history is what we have you know already taken uh, as an indicator now let us say that the patient had a high drops baby at 32 weeks in the previous pregnancy okay now when should i start monitoring i i have already explained the events that it will take at least 6 weeks for the hematocrit to fall so i would now start you know uh, of course you know uh, will do all the previous scans and in the first visit also itself the icd and all but a proper good screening by ultrasound i will start around 6 weeks earlier that means 32 means 26 weeks and we will follow it up how we will follow it up with one single parameter which is the middle cerebral artery peak systolic volume now this is an amazing tool which we have which is totally non invasive and will give you maximum inputs as far as the fetal anemia is concerned and i am going to uh, discuss this a little later now if supposing uh, that sensitization has happened and you uh, have done an icd in the first visit itself right you know at 5 weeks pregnancy you can have all the signs of fetal anemia appearing even at 16 to 18 weeks so we can actually do intrauterine transfusions as early as 16 to 18 weeks only thing is that we need to suspect we have to be vigilant 
and we need to understand and we need to also have the resources or identify the fetal medicine people who are going to help us with these intrauterine uh, transfusions so a watchful evaluation fetal evaluation is something which we need to do and we need to start at least 6 weeks before the previous mishap has happened and then we follow it up with the middle cerebral artery and we follow it up till delivery now delivery timing also is important because in the neonatologist has to be kept a preterm because incompatibility plus preterm is going to really definitely have an effect on the mortality and the morbidity of this neonate i have borrowed this um, flow chart or algorithm from uh, dr prashant acharya's website uh, which really explains and i i mean you can have this uh, algorithm it really beautifully explains to you how to go about managing an uh, rh negative uh, woman in the antenatal period and this, um, i have already discussed this if you want i can just do that if here is an rh negative mother and if the husband is rh negative no further investigation is required if the husband is positive you need to do whether the husband is heterozygous or homozygous and that definitely will explain to you what has uh, going to be the further management and at least 50% of the babies are going to be affected now after you have done the indirect combs test which you will do on the first visit it itself if the indirect combs test is negative then follow up examination will happen around at about 26 weeks and that again you will repeat an icd you will do a middle cerebral artery psv and you will also give the antenatal profile axis at this point of time uh, which is going to be 300 micrograms depending upon what school you are following if you there is icd negative you can give 150 micrograms at this point of time and repeat another 150 micrograms at 32 weeks and that will cover the pregnancy till delivery now this is how we are following now if the patient is icd positive then you do the titers if the titers are less than 1 is to 32 and if on your scan everything else is okay all the signs which i showed you about hepatosplenomegaly or pleural or pericardial or ascites are not there then you follow this up every 2 weeks with icd and with a mca david ma'am can you hear me ma'am sorry can you hear me ma'am and miriam ma'am uh, yeah miriam yeah ma'am uh, apparently our talk is only for an hour and a lot of uh, queries are coming in uh, uh, so will you finish your talk I'm and then i'm finishing i am on the last few slides now okay sure sure they're all waiting to ask you questions that's why <laughs> so but i'm i'm going to answer a lot of questions in my talk also meriam so uh, sure, then, sure. you know we are following it up every 2 weeks and uh, if the signs and symptoms of uh, sensitization happen like fetal anemia is cover, uh, discovered or the mca um, is uh, raised then we need to take the corrective actions and that is where we will start correcting the anemia Uh, if the critical levels are higher at that point of time when you have done the first this thing uh, then you need to do a weekly follow up and uh, as soon as we have decided that this fetus is very much anemic then you need to do intrauterine uh, transfusion so fetal anemia is the worst complication which uh, can happen in this and if we have picked it up well that is our key role and aim and then we need to just correct this anemia now how are we going to do that so a simple is a color doppler examination for the middle cerebral arteries uh, and that is a very simple technique though we have now a lot of newer software and machines and you know other things available where you could do the cardiac function test and the fetal hq will actually let you measure the uh, all these parameters like fetal ventricular thickness and all that cardiac function things much earlier and much better so that is a very new latest thing which has come up the less useful criteria as i have already told about abdominal circumference head circumference and all those things you can still you know take uh, keep track of 
So RH immunization, we have to diagnose fetal anemia. We need to understand that we have to diagnose it before ascites or fluid across the fetal cavities happen. And why I am emphasizing this more and more? Because for, there is only 40% survival of the baby if hydropic changes have set in. And if we have picked it up earlier in a non-hydropic state, then almost we will salvage 85% of these babies. And that's a huge, huge number. And how do we do that? By a simple ultrasound examination, that's a color Doppler, where you can see that's the circle of villus. And these are the middle cerebral arteries. Now, middle cerebral artery, PSV, what we call as the peak systolic volume. Now, this is the peak systolic volume. Now, when I go a little further here, that's a normal MCA. And this is an MCA or middle cerebral artery of an isoimmunized anemic baby, where you can see, even at looking at the waveform, you can say that the peak systolic volume is much higher and there is hardly any diastole. And because hemolysis happens, there is thinning of the blood. So more blood uh, is going with a big velocity into the very small uh, artery, which is middle cerebral artery. And this is a very accurate and non-invasive screening tool for detecting moderate to severe fetal anemia. And uh, there's almost 100% sensitivity with a false positive rate of about 12%. Now, we have to understand that you have to take this measurement at the right angle. It's with the angle of insonation has to be very correct. And because otherwise you can have, you know, different sorts of uh, non-accurate measurements and then that will definitely affect your um, management of this uh, pregnancy. Now, you don't measure it before 18 weeks and after 35 weeks also there is not much reliability. So the important aspect is between 18 to 35 weeks. Now, how do we really understand that this is a severely affected baby? I'm going to move you to these Mari's charts, which are very, very important for us to understand. And uh, what do they do here? That we have the MCA, that is the uh, PSV, peak systolic volume of the middle cerebral artery. Here we have the weeks of gestation. It's a simple rule, uh, thumb rule, that if you have let's say a 20 week gestation, the MCA PSV should be double. That means 40. If it crosses 40, this baby has moderate to severe anemia and your intrauterine transfusion has to be started right here. And that's very important for us to understand. So if you have plotted this graph and if this graph moves along the median, nothing to do. Even in a sensitized pregnancy, everything will be normal and you can go ahead and you know manage this just normally. But if this graph, this is PSV of the middle cerebral artery crosses. Now you understand this here, that not all of us are fetal medicine people, not all of us are doing intrauterine transfusions. So if we are not doing intrauterine transfusion, this is the place where I will get alert. I will counsel the patient that, yes, you need an intrauterine transfusion. So please look for a fetal medicine person and start getting prepared for intrauterine transfusion. And if I am a fetal medicine person, this is the place where I will actually give intrauterine transfusion. So this is a very simple technique to follow and you can easily do it. Methods of transfusion, I am not going to get into details. Uh, it also depends on a lot of things, on the position of the baby, on the expertise of the person performing. Not very expert can do intraperitoneal transfusion. And the ones who are expert at it will do an intravenous uh, transfusion at the umbilical way or an intrahepatic uh, way. And uh, these are simple uh, procedures which uh, at the hands of fetal maternal um, experts. Uh, choice of blood to be transfused is O negative. Uh, you have to test the blood, of course, and then approximately we cover about 45 to 55% of the hematocrit. 
over correct little over correction is okay but if you transfuse too much also then the baby will get into polycythemia and have other repercussions so it's a very thin line between uh, which is very very important and lastly is the timing of delivery as i said neonatal backup facilities of a sensitized baby if it might need an exchange transfusion later on uh, all will depend upon the facilities which are available in your center and they should these babies should come up in a good neonatal unit and which has facilities for an exchange transfusion etc now special importance i do i have emphasized this is uh, one of the last slides uh, at the time of abortion cover has to be given we say 50 microgram is enough but it's not available so 150 is what you will have to give any invasive procedure you have to give about 30, 300 micrograms antipartum hemorrhage versions we hardly do any uh, but if something like that is happening then you have to cover up and always give a little more than what you think is required because many a times these calculations can also be wrong last what are the recent advances now i am sure all of you must be thinking it will help me if i can know the blood group of the baby whether the baby is rh positive or no now today uh, facilities are available by cell free dna where a mother's blood is taken as early as 10 weeks you can even earlier also at times where you can find out the uh, fetal genotype uh, rh uh, this thing and then if the baby is negative then you are uh, rest assured that nothing is going to happen uh, to this uh, baby and the last thing which i wanted to touch upon was the concept of partial d or weak d now i have already explained to you that these epitopes which are present on the rbc if they are lesser in number then the reaction which they produce is smaller and sometimes you know we we can have lots of issues as far as these uh, reactions or responses are concerned but needless to say if it is a weak d then it needs to be covered Uh, as much as a normal d so what are the take home points every woman of child bearing age should have an abo and rh typing done uh, husbands also should be uh, type for their rh and blood group right at the first visit or maybe other a uh, very very important thing which i would say is especially when we know that if uh, the girl is rh negative that this counseling is done even before marriage which is very important uh, if it can be done but if it cannot be done we are now getting into the uh, concept of uh, expanded carrier uh, screening this can also be a part of it and uh, you ensure that the icd is done at the first visit and then follow it up uh, according to the need and a single postpartum dose is mostly adequate for almost about 99% but 0.3% women might still require a larger dose so i'd like to thank each and every one of you for your patient hearing and uh, i think with these simple small steps um, it is our defeat if a baby becomes hydropic or we lose a uh, rh positive baby in an rh negative mother so uh, i'm sure this will help us in uh, managing our uh, rh uh, negative pregnancies in a much better way thank you very much thank you madam once again uh, madam you have proved uh, you are a wonderful teacher uh, i think i still remember uh, during our all kerala conference when we conducted in cochin madam was clearing the doubts and she uh, reached late to the airport and missed the flight that is for how the Uh, uh, teacher in the uh, Jaydeep Madam. So over to you, the chairpersons, uh, for the questions. Um, questions actually, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, Madam. Oh. <coughs> questions asked actually to come on the screen and then went off. Is it possible to uh, repeat the questions, or else shall I add one or two recent yes, yes. points? Yes, Madam also can add and also ask questions and ask the audience questions also because. Yeah, more than seven hundred and ten uh, people have. Uh, one or two questions was actually uh, whether uh, when do we repeat the clear test after delivery? If we suspect massive hemorrhage, usually we suspect three uh, hundred will cover up to 
300 microgram will cover up to 30 ml. But if there is mass hemorrhage, then there is a place for clear uh, test and then appropriate doses can be calculated according to the percentage when the, uh, uh, how much of the blood is entered. That is one uh, recommendation. But so that repeated doses of intramuscular can, has to be given after the clear test estimation. And then after the MCA PSV, if it is more than 1.5 MOM, and if, the, if it is preterm, and we are planning for indirect uh, transfusion, we need to look for the hemoglobin to the fetus and also the hematocrit because MCPSV is not 100% sensitive. So we need to look for the hemoglobin and, and another thing is we, are, we need not wait for the severe anemia to occur. Even at moderate anemia, we have to give indirect transfusion so that the outcome is better. And uh, recent, uh, actually previously uh, sensitized mother, suppose the ICT is very high even at 15 weeks, we are not FC, less than 20 weeks and more than 35 weeks, it is technically difficult for intrauterine transfusion because at 15 weeks the vessels are very, anatomy structures are small and it is impossible to give. At that time, the newer recommendation is plasma pheresis and IVIG. This is a newer recommendation uh, for the earliest weeks and from 20 weeks onwards only it is possible for us to do the MCPS. When at 35, 35 weeks, if it again we can go for delivery rather than giving an again intractable transfusion and then postnatal trans, uh, transfusion to the fetus. And then to, for the prevention of alloy immunization or uh, for the uh, already alloy immunized patient, if there is a bad obstetric history, the recent uh, uh, recommendations are if you can go for IV PT, you do a prenatal genetic testing and find out whether the fetus is RHA positive or negative. And then only transfer RH negative embryo and provide the husband is heterozygous. And another recommendation is either a donor sperm or even a genetic uh, 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 gestational carrier, that is, uh, a carrier is not having antibody. These are the newer recommendations uh, from the up to date. And then there are certain questions like even Madam already told that first trimester. Uh, any bleeding, any any procedures you have to give 150 uh, 50 or less than 12 weeks, definitely uh, 150, more than 12 weeks it's definitely 300. And then, uh, if we have given an antipartum prophylaxis, the a silent uh, fetal mitral hemorrhage can occur and the incidence is 2 percentage. <coughs> when we give antipartum prophylaxis, that can be reduced to 0.2 percentage. So when should we give? Well, usually we read about 28 weeks. But Madam told it's a very good point that either you give a single dose at 32 weeks or you can uh, repeat at 26 and then 32 weeks. But if the woman delivers within 12 weeks, there is no need for anti-D. Is it, Madam? Is it JT? Sorry. The woman delivers within 12 weeks uh, of the anti prophylaxis. After 12 weeks? Within 12 weeks, if she delivers. Antipartum prophylaxis, if she delivers within 12 weeks after yeah. the last dose or the first dose, uh, there is no need for an anti isn't it? Basically, it, the cover is for six weeks. So, we, we have to understand this, uh, that the cover is only for six weeks. So, if, okay. if the difference between the antipartum prophylaxis and the delivery is more than six weeks, then you need to cover it up. Okay, okay. Okay. So I was just going through the questions. But uh, an embryonic gestation, whether it is indicated. Yeah, an embryonic. Question. Now, if I understand logically, um, there is no need. Eh? If there is no embryo, if there is a yolk sac present, you know, the erythropoiesis is not going to be there. So I don't see any reason for um, the profile axis to be given. But if you have seen the yolk sac and if you have not seen the uh, this thing that there's always I think it's always better because the let's say the mistakes can happen in identifying a small v fetal pole also. So if you can give about 150 micrograms, it is always better to cover it up. And similar is true for ectopic pregnancy also because uh, ectopic when it's an early six to seven weeks or maybe eight weeks ectopic pregnancy, uh, the cover has to be uh, basically uh, given. Um, so I'm just going to go through the this thing. 
is there any role of anti d injection in the second and the third trimester in a previously sensitized woman the answer is no uh, because i uh, have already told you that if she comes icd positive then there is no role of anti d in this woman at all but she is already sensitized there is nothing you can do about it so there is absolutely no role then uh, please uh, please let me know the recent concepts about uh, rh immunization i think whatever i knew i have told and rest madam radha has already added uh, some very very good uh, uh, points how to go about infection prevention i don't understand the relevance of this question here uh, infection prevention um, i mean uh, these are the regular uh, things which we need to actually do um when should we give anti d as prophylaxis and when should we it be repeated as i said we normally expect that you know the delivery will happen between 38 or 39 weeks which normally generally is the due course in most of the clinics so we calculate it accordingly so i have to come 6 weeks before that means 32 weeks and another 6 weeks before that is about 26 weeks so the first dose of antenatal prophylaxis you can give at 26 weeks and the second dose you can give at 32 weeks and we hope that it will cover uh, 38 weeks or till pregnancy and then after that a postpartum prophylaxis uh, has to be again given if the baby is the other school of thought is that you only give one dose at 32 weeks and that that will be 300 micrograms and the in the first we give 150 micrograms at 26 weeks and 150 so the cost is the same we have to understand that but supposing now uh, about 6 15 16% of the women will have uh, sensitization at uh, in the second trimester and if i have not covered up the second trimester then the problems will arise so i personally feel that two uh, doses of immuno prophylaxis one at 24 to 26 weeks and the other one at 32 weeks will probably be a good option but uh, i also know that you know uh, that um, uh, uh, american and the uh, european uh, they have two different uh, regimes one follows 32 weeks and one a single dose and the other follows uh, two dosage so um, if we are free we can you know use whichever one we uh, want now the it's an rh negative patient with history of two abortions when we give anti d is the now we have to take a history what at what gestation the previous two abortions happened whether there was antenatal prophylaxis given at uh, that i i mean post uh, post abortion prophylaxis was given at that time or no if it is covered if the woman is in itself you will do an icd if she is icd negative then you just follow up 26 weeks and 32 weeks and you are done and you are good now the problem arises if she has not been covered and she is icd positive in the first instance itself and then you have to understand that now this pregnancy will need extensive monitoring because here we do not have uh, the uh, you know little uh, knowledge about that okay the mishap ha had happened at 32 weeks here early abortions have happened and this pregnancy is sensitized so you will have to monitor with icd and also all the ultrasound parameters and mca starting from let's say 16 to 20 weeks and follow it up and as the titers or rise or the mca psv rises and crosses your mari's chart and a mom of 1.5 uh, uh, you need to do a intrauterine transfusion and if she remains under then this pregnancy is good and you can just carry on and uh, will not require any major intervention um okay the antenatal uh, antenatal rh antibodies for rh isomenized mother following next pregnancy yes or no 
antenatal or that basically you mean an icd test um isoimmunized mother uh, means what she means icd positive for me so uh, i don't understand uh, all what we have discussed already if she is icd positive then there is no need for an, any antenatal profile access in this particular pregnancy all you have to do is follow her up as a high risk and mca bsv and intrauterine transfusion okay then uh, can we avoid giving antd to a patient after ftnd who received it at after 30 weeks of gestation for some reason the answer is no if the baby is positive because at 30 weeks meaning the cover was only till about 36 weeks so uh, this baby uh, uh, if has del delivered after 36 weeks or even if it has delivered before also you will need to cover this up Unmute. grandmother uh, was rh negative she is trying to ask something there is some defect hello ma'am uh, okay. uh, can you hear me ma'am yes yes echo is yeah. coming so they want to know that um, after 72 hours for some other reason for some reason antd was not given so for how long can we continue to give antd is it a very yeah. use with after i days? i answered this actually in my talk also yeah. uh, see ideal is within 72 hours yeah. but if for any reason you have not been able to or the patient only came to you late between 9 to 10 days you can give it might still give you some protection and the reason is very simple igm develops within a week so that is where and after igm's development with within 6 weeks to 6 months igg will develop so you have that one week period where or maybe a little longer where you can uh, try and cover this up uh, as much but how much cover will be there Uh, because see we have to understand that not everyone who has a fetal maternal bleed will get sensitized only, only about 16 percent of them can get sensitized so yeah. we can take a chance sure. the other person wanted to know about the uh, antd in someone who is contemplating sterilization ma'am somebody is having a sterilization uh, do you recommend that they take antd you know okay. uh, i would still do it honestly speaking because i am an ivf specialist and i know that you know lot of times if supposing if somebody is uh, had a mishap in the family and they come back for a recanalization or an ivf later on i would i would definitely cover it sure. especially and especially if i'm doing a sterilization after two two uh, babies especially if they can afford we can we must offer no madam i would do it I yeah. think yeah, we have few more questions. Before that, I like to tell that more than nine hundred and seventy-seven people have logged in. I think we have lot of questions. I think Dr. Miriam, uh, if you are asking with one thing, reduce the sound of the other. The echo is coming. Okay. Sure. Ma'am, okay. they were worried about one in four dilution. Should should you consider ICT positive, um, or one in four dilution can be ignored? actually we need to understand these dilutions now supposing if there was a larger antibody load in the body now uh, i would divide i would dilute it to half it comes positive now if it is larger i will dilute it four times it is still positive i if it is even larger i will dilute it to 116 32 times now the larger the load the longer or the larger dilutions it will be positive so higher the load it will be positive in more dilutions so if it is only positive in one in two i am not worried and as i was telling you that if you have given an uh, rh uh, antd injection then the icd will be positive for a week but the dilution will not be larger than one is to two and we call critical as 1 in 32 now that 32 somebody can have sensitization at 16 also and somebody will not have sensitization at even 256 or 512 
so those are you know individual responses which we need to consider madam uh, the next i have a question uh, the chart says ict at the first visit then at 26 uh, uh, and 32 weeks followed by ndd 150 each if needed the last slide is different for 20 24 28 weeks final statement what is it actually uh, those are the indian uh, recommendations which are there i actually in our own algorithm we have modified it uh, according to the timing of the delivery so i explained to you that we normally deliver around 38 or 39 weeks so that is why we cover it up at 32 weeks 26 weeks but you can do it the other way around also it it doesn't really make much difference if you are doing a postpartum uh, profile access okay the next question is uh, from miriam please unmute the laptop okay sure sure okay madam it is madam carry on uh, so uh, this i was reading grandmother is rh negative and the mother is rh positive and the daughter is rh negative any issues now let us understand it's a very complex puzzle the grandmother is negative and the uh, the mother is positive so what does that mean that the father was heterozygous positive so 50% of the children will be positive here and 50% will be negative now the mother is positive and the daughter is negative is it possible sorry if the mother is positive yeah. yeah okay so the mother here will be heterozygous positive yes okay and if the father is also negative then there are chances that the daughter will be negative you understood so we need to know what the mother's i mean this daughter's father is you understood so there are actually uh, absolutely no issues the role of uh, rh immunoglobulin in antenatal period i think i have uh, already explained so i don't need to really go into this the next one is uh, when to give anti d this also we have actually you know discussed quite a bit um then management of indirect coombs test positive mother this also mary we have actually discussed uh, thoroughly a number of times uh, then uh, you have already asked me about these dilutions which have been also explained uh, somebody has written hope we can get this material yes you will get this material from science integra so uh, go ahead and ask them because uh, this is their intellectual uh, property now Uh, do we perform the test for fetal maternal hemorrhage postpartum i have explained that if we have had a larger than normal uh, bleed in the post uh, in during the delivery you must do it especially like you know cesarean sections where you have done manual removal of the placenta or twin pregnancy or you have done a cesarean section for an accidental hemorrhage you must do it because these are the cases where a larger dose might be required so uh, that is where you must do it and it's very simple there is absolutely no rocket science in this only thing is that we have to have a mindset in uh, understanding and then you know giving the dose sterilization uh, we have already answered when ict should be done in primary and multi you know normally we don't uh, do icts in the primary gravida but there are number of instances if you have not taken the history proper uh, of previous abortions and many women hide it uh, believe me uh, you have to subtly ask because if she is an rh negative and uh, so you have to subtly ask the history and if you still feel uh, then icts should be done because we are very unsuspecting but uh, in that uh, not suspecting this thing if you have missed out on the sensitization in this then you will will lose this baby which is the first baby for this mother 
history of ectopic pregnancy history of uh, embryo reduction uh, whether cover cover was done or no all those thing all those histories have to be put in place and that is where a primary gravida can have sensitization and ict can be positive in these uh, patients um, so we aisha we need to uh, you know take a proper history if the patient cannot uh, antenatal or postnatal anti d injection can we give a single um see uh, that is a chance which you and the patient has to take uh, as we said not all of them will have uh, sensitization during the antenatal period uh, but there is a group of patients where you will you need to educate them because even after uh, sensitization in the uh antenatal period only 16% of the uh, women will get sensitized and mm-hmm. will have isoimmunization and you know problems later on so we don't know which which out of those 100 are which 16 are going to have so we need to explain to the patient and if she wants to take a chance uh, it's her call it's not my call because if i give antenatal profile access and i am reducing that 16% to 0.1% so my um, uh, job is that i basically uh, you know cover up as much as possible now uh, how much ml of fetal cells could elicit sensitization and how much anti d should be given now uh, we uh, as i said as little as 0.03 ml or less than 0.1 ml is the amount where you can have uh, create a sensitization so uh, it is very uh, small amount which could elicit sensitization and as anti d we were saying that uh, if we give 300 micrograms of anti d it actually neutralizes uh, almost about 30 ml of the fetal maternal bleed so it covers up quite a, a lot of of the fetal maternal uh, bleed and so i uh, think ma'am they are asking above above the 300 microgram for each ml okay. of fetal maternal okay. how much more so uh, the ml is has to be calculated accordingly so supposing now instead of 30 uh, 30 ml bleed you have had a 45 ml bleed you will give 450 uh the largest dose lot of times people ask what is the largest dose so in the literature the largest dose given is about 1200 micrograms so uh, start i mean you can give uh, up to that much because see if you give a dose which is inadequate you are still going to cause sensitization so it has of no value you if you are suspecting a larger bleed you must give uh, the adequate dose which will cover up the whole bleed okay and uh, is fetal r dna for rh testing being practiced uh, uh, see it uh, what my point of telling you is that it is available so wherever required you can order it and if you know that this especially in heterozygous uh, husband if you know that this baby is rh negative then you are not bothered all that monitoring which we have been talking about uh, will not be required and uh, you you and the patient will rest assured and be you know uh, as sedated as possible the, um, they concerned about why not to give oxytocin ma'am after delivery especially after because, a cesarean because you know uh, oxytocin the uterine contractions will push in the blood into the mother much more and uh, than what is really expected normally so even in a cesarean we would not give oxytocin ma'am yeah uh the chart says that icd at the first visit and then 26 weeks and 32 weeks uh, followed by 150 uh, anti d if required the, uh, this i have already answered because this is a modification which we have done in our own algorithm uh wo uh, madam i just want to clear it out a line oh, oh, sorry i just wanted to uh, interrupt you one minute you said about oxytocin you mean to say we not going to give any oxytocin or any method no, no, not at the anterior shoulder not at the anterior shoulder which we normally give you can give a little later oh, so you can give your active management of third stage but you yes. give it later yes yes yes, yes. yes. uh 
is there an upper limit for time before which we should collect the blood for fetal maternal uh, hemorrhage uh, upper limit means uh, what because you know these rbcs will survive in uh, the mother's blood uh, for quite some time the these are the which have come up uh, and uh, so we need to understand that you need to give enough time for them to mix up in the mother's circulation and we need to also give the anti d within the first 72 hours so uh, my upper limit is defined i mean it's absolutely logical to understand it like this okay uh and threaten the abortion just threaten the uh, abortion so just threaten the abortion do we need to yes give anti d yeah. so, so yes. threaten yes. abortion is what Yes. The portion is subchorionic bleed. Yeah. Our uh, subchorionic bleed also will have fetal maternal hemorrhage. Uh, even when uh, when we do amniocentesis, we do chorion villus sampling. When we do embryo reduction, they all cause hemorrhage, and they all will can lead to potential sensitization. And that's why we need to cover them up all. And in those cases, like you know, some people decide in the first trimester. we will give a smaller dose now as i said in our country only mm -hmm. uh, we get 150 and 300 so the minimum dose we can give is 150 and that should be given so at any of these procedures you should give that 150 and then for the next 6 weeks even if there is a sensitizing event you won't give it yeah sure. it's not required it's not required so i think i have done uh, with uh, all the questions and it's already 7:30 uh, thank you so much so thank, thank you, you so, so much, much. Uh, i have had wonderful interactions with all of you and uh, god bless you take care and thank stay you for answering all our stay questions safe. madam thank you. Uh, we are uh, from the on behalf of cochin society i thank uh, madam for taking uh, this much effort and coming in spite of uh, uh, odds there about the heavy rain And, and I'm happy that we have nearly nine seventy-seven people who are logged in, and we and, and there was a lot now of questions also that we could, madam could answer. And also, I am thankful for all the chairpersons for uh, uh, chairing this session, especially Adamni, madam, Miriam, and Smithy, and also for the science integrate team. They have once again proved that uh, they coordinated the event well, and also Barisram for uh, all the technical and. Uh, the support of uh, initiating this event and over to gracie madam thank, thank you, you very thank much you.